Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to UCLA Anderson's first annual Technology and Society Conference presented by our Easton Technology Management Center. It, I, it goes without saying that we're living in extraordinary times. Uh, the needs of our society are growing. Uh, they've been accelerated by the COVID pandemic and ongoing racial inequities. Uh, we also live in times when technology has become an increasingly important part of our lives. How we are educated, where we shop, uh, uh, where we work and how we interact. Technology is enhancing progress across multiple sectors, disciplines and geographies, yet uh, we also live in a world with great digital divides uh, that must be narrowed to ensure a vibrant economy and society for all. And more and more leaders are being asked to make decisions on some of society's most complex problems. And this requires an understanding of trade-offs and the impacts of leaders' decisions on various stakeholders. I believe that Anderson, all of us here, have a unique opportunity to provide thought leadership to ensure we're developing the next generation of impactful leaders, uh, that we're going to support the uh, ongoing professional lives of the broader UCLA community, and ultimately, uh, that we all contribute to a better society. With this context uh, and in this spirit, I'm very pleased to see that our UCLA Anderson Easton Technology Management Center launched the first annual technology and society conference, uh, which seeks to understand these critical issues, opportunities, trade-offs, and leadership imperatives. I hope you find today's conference valuable and that you use the opportunity to engage and to learn and to give back to those around you. Now, I'd like to introduce Terry Kramer, Faculty Director of the Easton Technology Management Center and the moderator of today's keynote discussion. Thank you. Great. Hey, Tony, thank you so much for, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for your support of the Easton Center and you know, thank you for all the work you're encouraging all of us to do to think about leadership paradigms. You know, in this environment where technology is changing almost every single sector, in this environment where we have COVID-19, in this environment where people are questioning institutions and what their roles are, you know, thank you for your leadership and encouraging us to think about these, these paradigms. And as Tony mentioned, you know, this is gonna be our first annual technology and society uh, conference. And as such, let me start out with a couple of slides here about what we're hoping to accomplish and what the agenda looks like uh, today. So let me start out here, three goals for the conference. And I'm hoping by midday today, when we finish, that we're on our journey to accomplishing each of these three goals. The first one is to talk about how technology can be used to help in major areas of societal need. And I've listed three examples here, healthcare, transportation, and education. And understanding how technology-based innovation can change outcomes. And as many of you know, with disruptive innovations, the most dramatic form of innovation, often we see lower costs and better outcomes. And so that ability to create that type of environment in these areas of societal need should be huge. Second goal for today is to understand the growing tech lash. So whether this is antitrust issues, data privacy issues, issues about social networks and misinformation on social networks, or future of work, more and more, there's growing a growing kind of pushback on many areas of technology-based innovation and how we understand where these are coming from and how to effectively deal with those, to me, is the second goal of the conference. Third goal of the conference is putting all this together, is thinking about what are the imperatives for leaders? So knowing the opportunities are out there, what areas do we focus on and how do we think about product design, especially given some of the concerns on tech lash issues? How do we think about engaging with regulators and elected officials? How do we think about the role of business versus government? So all of that would be really the leadership imperatives that hopefully would come out of the, uh, the conference. Now to do all of this, we've got a great agenda today. We're gonna to start out talking about one of the most fundamental areas at this intersection of technology and society, which is the future of work, how our lives are gonna change in so many areas and how our work is gonna change. We'll then do a deep dive in healthcare, one of the areas that's got the greatest need in terms of innovation and what are some of the greatest areas of innovation happening there. 
And then finally, we'll do a panel discussion about thinking about product design, especially in an environment where artificial intelligence offers many opportunities, but how to avoid bias being injected into new products, new services. And again, we've got people from great organizations to, uh, to share that uh, uh, with us. So let me, uh, let me shift over here now and just talk about our first uh, topic here. And this first topic is really oriented around the future of work and introducing uh, Steve. And to give a little bit of context here, Tony alluded to some of these areas of innovation. So if we think about areas like virtual assistants that can handle lots of uh, call center activities, if we think about autonomous vehicles, both in a consumer application and an enterprise application. If we think about examples of recommendation engines that could happen in e-commerce, can happen in media. If we think about diagnostic tools in healthcare, there's a whole variety of solutions out there that offer significant promise. But again, on the opposing side, there are many things that will fundamentally change the type of work we do, the types of jobs that exist, how do we interface with machines, and then ultimately, and probably the most worrisome, is will jobs go away? And if they do go away, who owns that problem to ensure we still have successful uh, outcomes? We hope to cover all of that during this fireside chat with uh, Steve uh, Hatfield. Now, I can't think of a better speaker for this first topic than, uh, than Steve. He's the global future of work leader for Deloitte. And interestingly, his, he's a self-proclaimed corporate anthropologist. So he thinks about the economy at the intersection of anthropology, of sociology, and of business. And his background is equally fascinating and eclectic. He started out as a volunteer with the Peace Corps. Then he went on uh, to go into management consulting, had a bunch of great clients, including Merrill Lynch, at a time that Merrill Lynch was starting to first use automated tools during the dot-com era and has continued working with a variety of clients thinking about the use of technology and the impact on work. He has uh, written a series of articles he's used as a subject matter expert by a variety of publications and media, including the Wall Street Journal, including the Washington Post and the Huffington Post. Um, he's got a master's degree in social change and development from Johns Hopkins University, and he's got an MBA from uh, Wharton. Now, in terms of the format we're going to use, I'm going to ask Steve a series of questions, uh, and then we'll go to a moderated Q&A. So for the Q&A, please go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, enter in the event code, TSC, so Technology and Society Conference, TSC1, and then enter in your questions. I'll endeavor to pose the most popular questions as they come up. So let me start out, Steve, a huge welcome. Great to have you uh, kicking off the, uh, the conference. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, everybody. Very happy to be here. Very excited to be in this conversation with you. Wonderful. So, Steve, let me just start right at it. I always like to get the broad landscape and then we kind of work our way into specific areas. If you look across all the different clients you've worked with and various issues on the future of work. Give us a sense of the big themes that you're seeing in the, in the future of work. Sure. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. In, in the pre-pandemic period, the trend lines that we were talking about were the dialogue in the market around the automation of jobs, the robot apocalypse, right? The trend lines around the dramatic need to upskill and reskill our workforce. The trend lines around um, the changing nature of the demographics, the multiple generations in the workforce and how that's impacting how organizations are grappling with different strategies to engage, curate, access, develop, retain, and so forth. And, and then finally also the trend lines around the online worker, the gig economy. And what did that mean in terms of that new talent model? And what did they need in terms of social safety net? And then the pandemic hit. My favorite quote is one by Anne-Marie Slaughter. She's um, the head of the New Enterprise Foundation, right? The coronavirus is a time machine to the future, accelerating trends that we thought would take place over decades in a matter of weeks. And so now the dialogue around, well, how do I use a gig worker has shifted 
right? They would be another screen on this Zoom call, right? The dialogue around automation and what does that mean in terms of changing nature of work has shifted. It's, there's still a strong conversation about automation and digital technologies and digital transformation, but suddenly conceptually, the idea of doing work in virtually in a remote environment, the demonstration effect is clear, right? Mm -hmm. There's still um, an emerging conversation about the different generations and the, the nature of your workforce, but it's actually shifted even further now because it's becoming apparent that it's, it's not useful to make blanket statements about all of our millennials are gonna be effective at versus all of our Gen Xs are gonna be ineffective at. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's persona-based. And, and um, uh, even more interestingly to me, the, the conversation around, well, how do I manage them? How do I engage them? How do I know they're being productive, mm -hmm. right? And you are seeing some of the trend lines around these mindset shifts pre-COVID, but suddenly, it's as though the pandemic has sort of put a spotlight on all those things that weren't actually fit for the future that's coming because now the future is here and certain things just aren't working. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Steve, let's see, um, dive into a, several areas now. First of all, by sector, when you look at changes in the future of work and whether that's automation or something else, how we interact with machines, give us your view about what sectors do you think we'll see the biggest changes in? It's a great question. I think that, I mean, it, it, it's almost more interesting to think about it in terms of the worker type, right? So the, the sectors that were exploring some dimension of digital transformation pre-COVID, the sectors that were already geared to, if you will, a knowledge worker environment, right? Those two different um, trend lines experienced some interesting resiliency that in some ways surprised themselves. So we actually saw organizations that had been developing better work from home policies and, and had been providing, if you will, um, those skill sets, techniques, hardware, equipment, bandwidth to their workforce were able to adapt very quickly. Like examples of contact center and operation centers in China even that maintained an 85% um, response rate even through the pandemic as everybody shifted to going offline. Mm -hmm. And other organizations, production lines that had been, had been testing out rather than have five or six people in the plant ready to address any part of the production line that goes down, let's connect them all via virtual toolkits, have them in multiple plants and bring them together via an alert system. One person may actually be addressing what's physically going on while others are sort of providing the knowledge to the team via the virtual toolkit. Those, there were prototypes of that in play instantly they were sort of pushed forward and enabled those production lines to create greater health and safety issues, social distancing and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting the extent to which that level of digital transformation has moved at a pace. Mm -hmm. We did a study with Forbes, 77% of the CEOs in our study said that um, their digital transformations were accelerated through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So of course, the flip side is that there are those frontline workers, right? Um, so the, the retail branch staff in, in a bank or the retail shop staff in any um, uh, retail and consumer operation, they all experience something completely different. And, and then what started to emerge is the need for the back office in the banking environment and the surging activity that was going on there to take advantage of the folks that were in the front office that may not have been doing anything and how do we redeploy them? Mm -hmm. And so that became suddenly a very interesting sort of challenge and a problem. What mm -hmm. we're seeing now, I would argue, is that organizations are grappling with, how do I accelerate to the future of work through the return, through the reopen? Mm -hmm. And you've probably noticed in the, the, the headlines, the tech, technology companies are setting the stage for this. Mm -hmm. they, they're the ones that have said right off the bat, we're not going to go, we're going to stay remote for a full year, Google. Uh, our remote work policy is going to be permanent, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Other organizations that have even pushed the dialogue further to, um, to say, we will, we will enable a flex policy where you can choose to work from anywhere. And depending on where you choose to work, your, your benefits package will, will accommodate, be that a work from home stipend, a travel budget a labor cost reduction, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, 
what what seems to be the case now is that the science-based organizations, life sciences and healthcare, engineering, are starting to um, follow suit. They're asking a lot of these these of these sorts of questions, and I think I would argue that financial services is maybe a step or two behind that. Mm-hmm. Additionally, I would argue that many of the so many of the organizations that rely on a very sort of complex supply chain with, with heavy production lines, the questions they're asking are all about how do we sort for a more resilient supply chain and how do we bring technologies to the factory to create a, a more robust smart factory. Mm-hmm. And you can see within those dimensions that very shortly from there, sort of the workforce and future of work type questions will pop. Yeah. And Steve, um, you're talking a lot helpfully about COVID-19 and how it's accelerated things. If you were to pull out your crystal ball and try and share with us what you think the new normal is going to be, you know, on one extreme, people say we're going to go all the way back to the way we were doing things. We liked it and we interfaced and whether it's in how we shopped or where we went to school or or uh, how we worked, et cetera. Where is the new normal to you? Do you think it's somewhere balanced in between and we're going to all end up in a hybrid type model? Do you think it's going to vary a lot by sector? What's your view on on, uh, how we come out of all this? Great question. So um, I I absolutely think it's going to be much more of a hybrid model. We're not going back. We're not going back. Um, and, And in part because we proved to ourselves that this is possible, right? And in part because... Um, the worker preference and worker sentiment now has more weight than it ever has in terms of shaping those, those end results. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then in part because we need to keep in, keep in mind the digital toolkits keep getting better and better. Mm-hmm. So even Microsoft has recently done a study on the brain waves and how they're impacted through, through being on these calls and they're adapting their digital toolkits to sort of help address some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so we're going to see a continued evolution of the nature of the digital workplace, the, the uh, digital reality and, and virtual reality tools that we use. And that will also further our being more effective and productive in the, um, in the virtual world. Mm-hmm. But that said, we're social animals and work is still a very social environment. And there are certain things that though you could potentially do them virtually, the ideal state is to not. The, mm-hmm. the strategizing, the collaborating, the innovating, um, and so what I really believe will happen is, is the work itself will start to be transformed in a way that enables what humans do or want to do, more collaborative work, right? Um, to take it to, to, to sort of rise to the fore, if you will. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the production level work, the things that are more geared to being automated, if you will, um, will, will of course be geared to the technologies and the machines. Mm-hmm. So the workplace will shift. You won't have logically um, a sea of cubicles anymore. That will be unneeded. Rather, mm-hmm. it'll be an environment where it's a destination, where there's a lot of collaboration space, lab space. Mm-hmm. Sure, there'll be interesting drop-in space for different workers who want that worker preference dimension. I need a quiet space today. But, um, but it's, it's not going to be the norm that you know, all of a particular function, finance or IT or sitting in the, in the cubicle, um, the cubicles on the floor in front of that leader. Makes sense. Steve, let me uh, again, try and extrapolate here from what you're saying in terms of there's a hybrid model, things are going to shift. What are the implications for work itself if you're in areas that were relying on the old model? So if people are going to be working more from home and you're running a restaurant, near what was a high rise office building. What happens to restaurants? What happens to office buildings? What happens to the modes of transportation people use to get into the office? Are there a bunch of kind of industries and companies on your red flag list as a result of this new model? It's a great question. I think that, um, I think that there's definitely gonna be a negative impact on the, the nature of the Shall we say the businesses that are that lean into supporting sort of that you know knowledge worker workforce that goes into a high rise, right? I, I think that there still will be the need for uh, offices, corporate offices and headquarters, but they'll start to look very different, and the way in which people use them will be very different. And so mm-hmm. it won't be this um, onslaught every day of the morning commute and everybody get trying to get into the office 
<laughs> and then being there every day, five days a week. And we were seeing some of the degradation of that even before the pandemic, but now the demonstration effect is, is, is pushing us into a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. I think that um, office space will still of course be important, but it will be completely rethought and you might use less of it in one location and have more satellite space that you take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Because the key will be the team leader will want their team to get together for certain reasons during the course of, the, of any one week. And they'll sort for where's the best place to be based on the best space and based on the best need of that team, the commute mm -hmm. time or whatever it might be. Yep. Um, and so, so what that means is the, the, those other businesses, the small businesses around the, those, those corporate headquarters will likely need to shift. But I think there'll be some interesting opportunities for them. It won't be as bleak as you know, black and white, sort of the, no, other, no other possibility because other spaces will start to open up and mm -hmm. will become of interest. Okay, Steve, let me ask you on that last topic you just raised, you know, people were talking until about a month ago, they were talking about the recovery, the economic recovery is being U-shaped or V-shaped. And more and more now they're talking about a K-shaped recovery where you have, you talked about them earlier, knowledge workers, you know, technology businesses, and they're gonna have a good recovery because the demand for their products and services is even greater. Plus to your point earlier, they've already kind of geared themselves for this environment. And then you have a whole bunch of industries that are in the bottom part of this K that are not either didn't have a plan and or their products and services aren't in as much demand as they were before. Are you a believer that it, th this is kind of the dark side of it all? There's gonna be a K-shaped recovery? Unfortunately, I think we're seeing the K-shaped recovery right now, right? The, um, the, the Times reported this morning that the, the yesterday's uh, earnings report for the, the big four, Amazon, Alphabet, um, Google, and Facebook, in terms of tech, was something like 38 billion. Yeah. Uh, Amazon was up 200%, right? Yep. Um, and so, so we're seeing those players sort of emerge from this or sort of in, in some ways benefit from this in ways that hadn't been expected. Um, the, and of course, then there's the dark side when you start to think about the hospitality and airlines companies, when you start to think about the small businesses, um, restaurants and so forth. But there are some other interesting emerging sort of positives. Construction workers are up about 7% over the period because of the kinds of home improvements that people are now thinking of doing, right? Um, and uh, freelancers, the job postings on for freelancers were up 41%, um, again, over the same period, in part because of the, the nature of what the digital worker can now bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And so though there is absolutely this K recovery, I think it's something that isn't as black and white as it might appear on the surface. And that there are ways in which we can begin to think about how to address grappling mm -hmm. with that. But now, now you're stepping into questions that we've, up, we've been in before, but haven't fully accelerated. What do we do around the digital divide? How do we help upskill and reskill in the right direction? Yeah. Good. Let me get, uh, now get into that area. So we've talked about COVID. We've talked about what may be a modified K recovery. We've talked about some upsides. Let's now get into a little bit more of the intermediate term and the long term on technology. So if we look at, let me give you a few examples here. If we look at autonomous vehicles and you look at that in an enterprise application, um, today there are 3 million truck drivers uh, in the nation. What happens if autonomous vehicles end up happening in trucking, and obviously remember the use case here is fairly compelling from a business standpoint. You know, reduced labor costs, reduced accidents, you know, uh, uh, more precision in delivery times because they can run 24 hours a day, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of one example. Let me give you another example, virtual assistants. There are also in the US about 3 million customer service representatives. And I don't know what the number is abroad. It's probably a number five, tenfold greater when you aggregate the whole world. And look at the ability to contextualize a conversation that many of the players that power a virtual assistant are working on. Um, will we see a massive uh, reduction in the number of jobs in, uh, in that area? In healthcare, um, with diagnostic tools over time that it's like a Google search engine that reduces the amount of time needed to do random testing, the amount of time it takes to figure out what ails somebody, that reduces the amount of time it takes to uh, uh, need physicians. 
If you go through all those, and I know these are a few years out, but what is your view about the impact on future of work? Is it, is it worrisome or no, for all those cases I just raised, there's a whole bunch of great cases? So I'm a little bit more of a possibilist, Terry, to take a, a, the term from Hans, Hans Rosling and factfulness. Um, I, I think some of what you're seeing is absolutely um, unfolding. No mm -hmm. question. Right. But it's interesting. We did it, our human capital trends report, the one that we did, have Deloitte have done over the last 10 years. It's the longest of its kind. The one we, we produced this year, 60% um, of the respondents said that they're using AI and these automation tools to augment their workforce. Only about 12% said that they're substituting. And so with every story that we hear about how a job will go away, there's actually this, this sort of nugget around, well, are we actually augmenting that job and helping that job become something different. So when you think about the trucking industry, you know, it, it, it became apparent to a company that we talked to that their truckers were actually the people that were interfacing regularly with their end customer and played a different role than just delivery. And so they wouldn't necessarily consider removing them from the job, though they may actually change not having them do all of the driving, right? Um, for customer service reps, you're seeing a, 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 a shift already to creating better self-service online, better chatbot and virtual assistant capabilities, but you still have a cadre of people that are the ones that deal with the more complex and sticky problems because mm -hmm. an automated toolkit can never create a human experience. And therefore there's this dimension of the rise of a human experience. And finally, with the example that you give around um, healthcare and doctors and diagnostics, mm -hmm. you know, Telemedicine jumped 11,000% during the course of the pandemic. It was barely touched beforehand, and now I don't think we'll ever go back. But you still have a, a, a doctor in the interface. I think what we're starting to see is the AI toolkits are much better at doing the um, diagnosis of a particular MRI or whatever else the, the, the scanning tool may be, the radiology and so forth. And so what we're starting to sense is that Doctors will want to tap into the, those toolkits because they can augment their ability to provide um, a, an answer, but but they they're not going to be replacing the doctor, mm -hmm. right? So it's again a, a matter of that level of augmenting. Yeah, and I think I think that more yeah. and more of that will happen. But interestingly, what it means is jobs will change, mm -hmm. and certain dimensions of what you brought to the table will now have to be different. So those doctors will need to be much more in a place to communicate, provide, be more empathetic, create a better experience around that, di around that um, diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? The truck drivers will be less necessarily actually navigating from A to B, but much more the customer interface in the process. Mm -hmm. And it'll be more and more of those kinds of permutations that emerge. Yeah. Uh, Steve, let me share my own conspiracy theory here to test what, what you just said. Um, and the way the conspiracy theory works is all of us as human beings generally don't like to be negative. We like to be optimistic. It's our nature. And certainly in the U.S. culturally, we're kind of known to be optimistic. So we don't like to go down a path that says all this is going to kill jobs. Number two, business people, when they're trying to introduce a new technology, a new product, are, are not going to come out and say, this is going to you know, allow you to get rid of 10,000 employees. They're going to say it enhances you know, effectiveness of employees and, and a variety of things because they're not going to want to you know, jolt people. But the people that are making the decision to buy ultimately are going to be looking at what's my ROI. And they're looking at how much labor savings against whatever the license cost is of the new capability. Last element of the conspiracy theory here is when you look at employee productivity of, it, of technology companies versus almost other every other company, uh, technology companies uh, get the most revenue, the most profit with the fewest number of employees. If you were to compare them to manufacturers, to retailers, et cetera, those are very labor intensive businesses. If things become more tech driven, why wouldn't we see again, massive labor productivity, i.e. less need of, of jobs? Do you buy any of the conspiracy theory that I've shared with you? So I buy some of it actually, and I'm not trying to come off in a way that feels very, shall we say Pollyanna. Hmm. So, you know, the World Economic Forum just produced a jobs report 
predicting about 85 million jobs are going to be lost due to automation by 2025. But they also said in the report that 97 million new jobs would be created over the same period. Mm-hmm. So there's this, that, that's the K recovery in some ways that you've, you're referencing, right? The dark side is we're going to create these new roles, but not actually upskill people into them. And yet we're going to create, we're going to take away these roles and pe- let, th- that cadre of folk will be left without. And so we, we've got to, we've got to get at sort of that particular dimension of it. Like how do we take advantage yeah. of the new jobs that will get created? Yeah. When it comes to the productivity question, you know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> It was, it was one of the questions that we got right away. How do I know that my people are being productive? And already the dialogue in the market had been around the productivity paradox, the dropping productivity across all economies, even though we had been investing in technology over, genera- over, over decades. And so what was going on? Our mm-hmm. hypothesis at Deloitte is that it's because you hadn't actually been thinking about the human in that equation. Mm-hmm. The ongoing automation of bad process didn't necessarily create the productivity you wanted because you weren't thinking about the human. You were thinking about it with an older Frederick Tayloristic mindset, if you will, right? The time and motion study kind of productivity level. You weren't thinking about it in the productivity that is today. In some ways, Terry, I would argue in the fourth industrial revolution, we're sort of moving back to to the, the moment where you actually own the creation and venture management and output of, of what, what, what your work is kind of like we used to in the days of the artisanal creation in the, in the, in the um, agrarian re- um, time frame. Mm-hmm. You're owning it from start to finish, right? You're owning it with a team. Only in the new world, that team and that team dynamic will also include machines. So it'll be a super team. It'll be you and the AI toolkits together creating that new venture, that new product or whatever it might be. Yep. Good, good. Let me ask one last question. I want to go to the audience uh, questions here. And that is geographic disparities. Mm. So, uh, you know, I I think your view is, you know, we shouldn't have this super dire view about all these jobs going away, but there will be a bunch of puts and takes in terms of new roles created and other ones going away. Is there a lack of kind of geographic equity here that there are going to be certain parts of the country, certain parts of the world that will have the disproportionate brunt of the transition that needs to be made and others that will be flying high in, in all of this? So I think in some respects, we're, we're experiencing a bit of a reshuffle, uh, almost, almost in the same way that we all migrated to the cities maybe 50 years ago. Um, it, it's starting to move in the other direction. It was already starting there a little bit. You saw the rise of certain centers um, based on worker preference, Salt Lake City, Bend, Oregon, things of that sort, right? Um, but, but I think it's actually been accelerated now. United Van Lines um, mm-hmm. indicated that they were up 45% in terms of people moving outside of mm-hmm. New York City and about 25% are moving outside of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And if you apply that a little bit more broadly, like a, you know, taking a more global view, it, it's interesting. The, the, the technology companies are still moving pretty aggressively to provide broadband access to everyone globally. If they're successful in some of what they've put forward, it's logical that about 7 billion people will be connected to the internet within the next five years. That's double what, it, what we have today. And of course, we're moving from 4G to 5G. Now, not everyone will have access to 5G, but, but you're, you're starting to talk about really effective connectivity. Mm-hmm. And currently in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 45% of the population that does have access mm-hmm. and is connected and the numbers are even uh, higher when you start talking about different generations. Evidently, the, the late stage millennials, it's closer to 85 or 90 percent have phones. So, so imagine the world that will emerge in the next five to 10 years where, you know, 7 billion people connected on the Internet will be able to connect into this vibrant digital economy. Mm-hmm. We can nudge everyone in the right direction around that. Yeah. And so I think that more rural areas will benefit. And I think that urban areas um, will might be in some respects the losers, but now we're getting into an interesting conversation on the vibrancy of the arts community in, in, in our urban centers and how that's going to likely come back strong, I would argue, after we all get out of these sheltering in place and lockdowns. Yeah. And so I think it'll be a different, a, 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 again, it's a, it's a reshuffle to a different mix. Yeah. Tom Wheeler, we had speak a couple of months ago. He's a former FCC chair in the Obama administration. He recently wrote an article that said his biggest worry about 
digital divide is actually in urban areas, not in, in rural areas. Do you worry that actually underserved communities will be disproportionately disadvantaged in all of this? If you said, hey, listen, you know, there's a lot of exodus and people moving and new, is there gonna be a net uh, negative effect there? Yes, uh, I'm very worried about it. I think, I think the pandemic pulled a, pulled a, um, put a spotlight on it in some ways right away because it was, it was, it was communities of color and, and women that were in some ways in the frontline workforce that was either impacted by job loss or impacted by you know, being the caregivers in the pandemic and sort of being in the riskiest of spaces. Mm -hmm. And so, so those communities are feeling the impact in, in very significantly. And, and it be, so it's become apparent that like, those are the communities where they potentially weren't if you will, connected to the knowledge worker and the, the, the digital economy that has emerged. And so how do we connect them? And how do we support um, driving, if you will, uh, as I call it, that nudge onto yeah. that digital train? Yeah. So some of that I think is, is, is back to what we said earlier around um, the demands around upskilling and reskilling, but a lot of it is also due to our educational system. It's not yeah. really geared to the fourth industrial revolution. It was built for the first and second. Okay, and I'm, I'm not gonna miss another opportunity to ask you a pointed question here. Um, who owns the problem? If we do find underserved communities are not being served well in this environment, if we do find the job outlook is worse than what you say uh, it is, does business own that problem? Does government own that problem? Do, does civil society own it? Who owns the, the, the solution here? If you say, I've gotta do some scenario planning if things get worse. So who I believe should own the problem or who's actually stepping up to own the problem? Uh, both. Okay, so let me, let me start with the latter. I'm, I'm actually very surprised and pleased by the way businesses are stepping up to own that problem. I think public policy is lagging in, mm -hmm. in solving for these issues. Mm -hmm. And so, and you're seeing it, like the whole rise of stakeholder capitalism coming out of the World Economic Forum and the way the business roundtable was focusing on purpose. And you saw a number of different companies stepping into the breach in a strong way around the investments they were gonna to make to upskill and reskill. You're seeing mm -hmm. partnerships between the tech companies and the community colleges to make sure mm -hmm. that the curriculums are exactly what you need to learn in order to step into you know, a Salesforce driven, cloud driven, Java driven world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so more and more and more of that is likely to emerge. And, and if the public policy arena can begin to foster that and really create an ecosystem of workforce development, I think we can step into a dynamic of solving. Mm -hmm. The other dimension here that I think becomes very critical, this is my personal view, is I, I think the dialogue on universal basic income really needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's a, a lot of different views on that. But the, the, emerging, the emerging discussion that I'm, I'm in often is that the, the economies who have a stronger social safety net can tap into this digital dynamic um, uh, environment much better because their workforce can comfortably step in and out, can upskill and reskill, and the, the, their needs are, are essentially cared for. In the Western societies where our social safety net is geared to our employment, it becomes much harder so in some ways, that tenant is a bit of a drag on that dynamism. And so how do we, how do we look at that um, in a concerted way? And how do yeah. we address that in a way that isn't going to tamper that dynamic economy? So you get into AB5 and what California is doing, and you start to, you think on the one side, that's really important to protect the gig worker, but on the other side, what is their real preference and what keeps that economy moving aggressively forward? Mm -hmm. And is regulation really the right answer? Yeah, fascinating issues here, by the way. I mean, we, the U.S. thinks of itself as being the leader, one of the leaders in digital transformation and technology, but you're kind of implying that the, the economic system we've got does not facilitate the transition well. Absolutely right. I mean, yeah. India, all of their population have digital identities. So they can, in some respects, tap into the digital economy much better for health yes. and safety records, for banking and so forth. And, 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 and you've seen what they've been able to achieve technologically. Now, I'm not saying that they're ahead of us, but they've got that plank in place. Yeah. So what are the other ones that we need to think about? 
Excellent. Let me start taking the audience questions. We've got a huge number of questions. Um, Georgi and a whole bunch of other people with him asked the question, if we are not going back to the kind of original mode we were operating in, how can companies think about encouraging employees to make and maintain human connections among themselves in the virtual world? It's a great question. I think right away we saw a lot of organizations grappling with worker sentiment, with, with team dynamics, with culture and leadership uh, along these lines. And what, what emerged pretty fast is the need for us to sort of take advantage of the fact that we can be more authentic. At this juncture, you're looking into my home office. You have a sense of what's going on here. Um, mm -hmm. My dogs recently ran outside and I was a little bit worried that you would hear them, right? So <laughs> that level of authenticity now exists and we can tap into that. I think the comp I think that what's complex here is that many organizations are sort of working on the the orthodoxy that I can't maintain a strong team dynamic, I can't maintain my culture, I can't apprentice, I can't innovate in a virtual world. I can't build relationships in this world. Yet there's the, the younger generations have been building virtual relationships their whole lives, right? And uh, in, in large consulting firms, we often find ourselves in positions where we're meeting a new person for the first time uh, as a team member virtually. And my role as a leader in this organization is to, is to nurture them virtually and we do that pretty well. That said, organizations have to begin to really plan. Well, what are those moments that matter in the lives of our workforce and how do we agree as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization to do certain things to nurture our culture, nurture those relationships in those moments? Mm -hmm. they're, they're welcome to the organization moment, their career milestone moment, the launch of a project team moment, the, you know, the, the close of a project you know, celebration moment. And mm -hmm. how do we sort for that in a way that we put emphasis on those moments? And those are the times when we can um, effectively do things that generate connectivity and culture. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Excellent. Let me ask you the next one here. Um, Let's see here, Lawrence asks, how do you expect productivity, creativity, and innovation through in-person collaboration to be affected as we acclimate to a fully remote work format? So, um, I think that we're gonna find, and we've been finding, that the reasons that you want to get people together matter in a different way. Like you wanna to get together for collaboration reasons. You wanna to get together to strategize. You wanna to get together to brainstorm and to innovate. And that a certain portion of what your team does or what your work process does has that in it. And so the team leader should sort for when in the, course, in the course of our work, do we want to get together physically and when do we need to be apart and how do we be apart? And if our teams get to be good at that, then you can maintain sort of a strong level of collaboration, a strong level of innovation um, mm -hmm. um, and sustain it. Mm -hmm. But it's not entirely 100% remote. It's just a larger portion of it can be remote, right? Part of what that also implies is that we fully sorted the digital toolkits that make that possible. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you were seeing a lot of that, um, of course, pre the pandemic. Um, product designers and engineers working on computer-aided design tools. Many firms adapting to different collaboration toolkits. But I would argue that work itself has yet to be fully re-architected to take advantage of these toolkits in the correct way. It has yet to be fully um, rethunk and redesigned and have the tools themselves reconstructed so that a seamless digital workplace and physical workplace emerges to enable the best of that in the innovation and creativity. And so what, the, what, what we're doing is we have an old, the, the mindset is the old mindset of a lift and shift onto a virtual tool. Mm -hmm. Well, this isn't gonna work 100%. How do I make this work? Well, let's really push the envelope on what's possible with these digital toolkits and you'll see some really interesting things emerge. Yeah, so yeah. Your, your, your thought is we're kind of using this old model. And if we were to look at sales as an example, you, you work in sales with a company, our model has been, we have to keep go meeting with the prospect all the time, all the way through the sales cycle. Very beginning, the middle to answer questions and the very end to close. And you're saying, you know what, we need to rethink a lot of this. Maybe you meet them up front and maybe you meet them again at the very end, but you don't need to meet you know, all during the middle uh, uh, of the process. Same thing with consulting maybe too. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I was reading about um, 
I think it was a quote from Tata and Sons, they were able to close sort of a multi-million dollar deal with six Zoom calls. Right? Certain businesses are actually moving along uh, exactly as you might imagine, right? So uh, without missing a beat. So so I, I don't, I think we have to flip the model a little bit. It is absolutely possible to maintain and build relationships virtually. It may not be ideal 100% of the time, but it's not a need to go back to the old way. What is that new sort of mix in, uh, uh, in uh, you know, sort of an interim hybrid sort of yeah. version? And on a related topic, one again, another popular question is how will this new environment affect consulting itself and working at, at firms like Deloitte? So, um, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tread carefully here. I, I think that Deloitte and other consulting firms sort of adapted very, very quickly to this sheltering in place, um, in part because we were already pretty disparate, pretty distributed, pretty virtual, and had already thought through some of those, how do we adapt, how do we deal with a highly distributed workforce in a regular way, right? Mm -hmm. A small example is that Deloitte had put some energy and effort into, into what we call the art of engagement and all of the senior managers and partners had been through some courseware of this type. Hmm. So we knew that culturally for us, it was very important that you launch a project in a particular way, even hmm. if it's a virtual launch, right? Just so that everyone's operating together. And part of that is working through some of those, how are we gonna to operate together as a team? When are we gonna to be together versus apart? Things of that sort. Hmm. So we were able to bring a lot of that to the table. The dialogue we're in now is, well, how do we have to rethink our physical workplace and how, how, when, when will we actually be working together physically again? Generally, that used to be on a client site, right? Now our clients are thinking about being more remote. Of course, during the pandemic period, they don't want, um, they don't want the consulting teams to be on the ground in general. And so now it's, a, it's an interesting dimension of, well, do we ever need to be physically with our client full time again? And I think the answer, of course, is going to be no, but, but we'll land in a place where we again define those moments where we do think it's really important that we're together, right? Versus those moments when it's it's actually much more effective if we work remotely, mm -hmm. and a new a new balance will be struck. Yep. And will this change the burnout in consulting? I mean, the travel burnout it it, it won't be viewed in as tough a way to to work at a consulting firm. I I think absolutely it will. I I think a lot of what gets in the way is that burnout, that travel, the impact it has on your family. Um, of course, there are some, some new hurdles to be sorted. How do I maintain a different work-life balance? How do I reinsert um, sort of what I need personally? How do I create downtime? How do I manage that blur of home and work? But I don't think that's specific to the consulting firms. I think that's many, many firms are grappling with that. Mm -hmm. And we'll absolutely be able to um, sort for, if you will, uh, as I keep calling it, that new balance. But, but because one of, the, one of the immediate benefits that we started to see, not just in consulting, but broadly, was the extent to which um, it was having a positive impact on your ability to stay connected to your family, you know, on the, the, the lack of a commute time, and on some of, um, you know, differing data sets on mental health, some mental health being better because of this, some of these stresses gone away, other mental health deteriorating because of the dynamics of managing homeschooling and or the anxiety of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can start to tease out what's pandemic driven versus what's actual the new world of work, sort of a more positive sort of dimension of things is, is, is in front of us. Excellent. Let me take uh, ask a couple last questions and then uh, we can do a, a summary here. Um, Lynn asked the question here about WeWork. So in this potential future where managers are picking spaces that better meet their space needs and geographic needs. Do you see players like WeWork filling the need basically for this distributed uh, workforce? Uh, I think that, I think we're going to see the rise of more and more co-working spaces. Uh, and, and, and I think it's going to come in many, many different forms. And WeWork is one example, but we're already seeing dynamics, uh, you know, you, you, you know, come to this country and be a digital worker, right? Um, different hotels yeah. are thinking, come here and, and, and it can be a, a workplace for you as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that because part of that is, is geared to then enabling that team to, to meet at a particular place and get some collaborative work done that they want to get done physically and it becomes mm -hmm. an experience and that rise mm -hmm. of the human experience. Some of it is because 
Um, you just want a place that may not be the home periodically, one day a week, or whatever it might be. If there's some activity happening, construction at home, you name it, you need another place to go and there it is. Some of it might just be because um, the, the social dynamics. When we start thinking about remote work and working from anywhere and we project past the pandemic, we're talking about a generation of people who already were trying to sort of work in coffee shops and work in different, you know, um, social environments. And I think mm -hmm. that will be part of what emerges in uh, the, the co-working spaces. Yeah. And Steve, uh, a couple of questions here about what will actually be the distribution of offices. So you were starting to touch on it. Will urban centers, uh, San Francisco, New York, Boston, um, kind of lose their core because people are going to want to, you know, want to or, or be able to work outside urban areas and that will change the distribution? Or do you see more of a hub and spoke model where there's still going to be kind of a, a headquarters and a main place that may be in an urban area and uh, just spoke operations? How do you see all that playing out? So uh, it'll, it'll absolutely vary. It, it, you know, of course, for those businesses where you need to have people at a distribution center or at a production line or in a lab, it'll, it, it, it will be harder to have a more distributed workplace, if you will, physically. But the trend line will be to something more distributed, mm -hmm. in part because people will opt for being further and further away from that core urban headquarters, potentially and want to have the opportunity to get together, but, but what's the right spot that's closest to us and is most convenient. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're, you're looking at financial services institutions who are thinking about how do we use our retail branch network differently. Mm -hmm. You're looking at, um, we were already seeing organizations not lease space, but, but, but um, contract with WeWork and other, and other co-working spaces. And I think more and more of that will ensue. And I think in some ways it'll be interesting because the spaces that create the most interesting space, the most, the worthiest destination, the best collaboration and lab space for, for you to use will be, will be the winners in this environment. Mm -hmm. There will still be headquarters. It will still be important. But even now you're watching REI walked away from its headquarters. Facebook mm -hmm. bought it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Palo Alto Networks is talking about using their headquarters much more as a um, a central center that we come to when we have large town hall like experiences, but it's not going to be used that often otherwise, and perhaps they'll figure out other use for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of big questions now about what is the nature of the kind of workplace that we really need and that network of workplaces that we really need. Mm -hmm. Good. And impact of all of that, Steve, on hiring practices if there's gonna be more flexibility in where people are based, um, is this gonna change, you know, kind of um, uh, opportunities for people in other places outside the coast, outside urban areas? Um, is this gonna change compensation issues? How does all this kind of change hiring activities? So interesting, you were seeing some of this emerge before the pandemic. And it's been, uh, you know, again, the theme of accelerating post. So Upwork, as an example, and that's um, a gig platform that hires knowledge workers like us uh, to do, you know, uh, gig knowledge work, if you will. They would say that 80% pre the pandemic of their clients were in North America, but 80% of their gig workers were in global locations. Mm -hmm. So it was possible for, you know, a 30 something old woman in Malaysia with, with a, a, a digital skill set to, to em become employed via Upwork with a Canadian company. And you were seeing that, right? So the, the, the dynamic around being able to source your talent and the capabilities that you need anywhere has been further accelerated. What's now started to emerge with the tech companies being the first out of the gate is, is you're, they're allowing uh, their workforce to decide to be remote workers and to move where they want to move. The New York Times study found that three out of five workers would actually move locations if given the ability to do so. And so we're seeing that dynamic. And if they successfully move in that direction, and many already have, then now that will start, and I believe, to set the stage for um, the, the remote or the working from anywhere dynamic and sourcing your talent from anywhere dynamic that, that, that we're now seeing, mm -hmm. which means um, you can start to think more broadly about the kind of skills and talent you bring to the table. Um, it, it means that people can move to more rural locations based on sort of their preference. 
Um, it does mean some different changes in, in hiring practice. And, and finally, um, we're starting to see it as a bit more of, you know, unleashing your workforce, per, look, unleashing their potential, unleashing your ability to redeploy them. And you have to figure out how then in an unleashed environment, do you access the talent you need it when you need it? Curate the experiences that help develop people and engage them to that point I made earlier about, you know, them having belonging and contribution and impact in order to stay connected to you. Mm -hmm. Good. So, uh, just to tag on to that, a, an additional question. We had an Anderson Forecast event about a month ago. I interviewed Scott Brady, who's one of the lead partners in Innovation Endeavors. It's Silicon Valley uh, venture firm. And one of the questions that came up is, are people going to move all over the country and kind of this, you know, uh, uh, de-densifying, et cetera? And now he, he does tech companies, but he basically said, you need to be in some of these centers where you're near an academic institution, you're near the ecosystem of investors, of large companies, of small, that kind of says we're still going to see, especially in tech, um, concentrations in certain tech areas. Again, San Francisco, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, et cetera. Do you buy that as well? Or are you saying nah, that, that may be a little bit overstated here? I think it may be overstated. So I, I'm, I'm, I constantly look at, at, at statements like that and think about, well, what is the mental model that you're bringing to the table? And so economists had long said there were the network effects of having certain industries and in certain centers, right? And so you saw that at Silicon Valley, you saw that in, in New York with financial finance, finance, you saw that in Hollywood, you saw that in a Jersey corridor around life sciences. And so those network effects is sort of a way that economists have been thinking about how clusters of talent will and businesses will sort of feed each other and create these ecosystems. But if all of those ecosystems are now able to be distributed to the point where you can connect virtually anywhere, mm -hmm. how relevant will that physical location be? And I think that for some industries, perhaps, because they are still lab-based or they still have a production line or whatever it might be, but I think for many, not so much. And as such, it will become Dif different hubs will emerge and they'll be more tightly networked. So it's hard to believe that, that the network effect of Silicon Valley will continue in, in a world where that mm -hmm. tech um, worker can work from anywhere and you're starting already to see the rise of other tech centers like Austin, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, think it's, I think that potentially is a bit of a, a, a model that's going to shift. Excellent. Steve, let me summarize what I heard you say, and then I'm going to give you a chance to upgrade if I got anything wrong, or if you have uh, parting uh, comments for everybody. This has been a fascinating conversation. It's clear that you do this for a living. Um, so the first takeaway that I had is that this importance of having a plan. It sounds basic, but you're basically saying, listen, as opposed to having this kind of model of yesteryear and then just saying, how quickly can we get back there and kind of force ourselves back into that model, the really successful companies have a more fluid and dynamic model about how and where work gets done about how they decide when and where people need to connect to create a sense of team, about how they create uh, creativity and what they do, that there is an emerging model that is likely hybrid in nature. It's not us going all the way back and it's not us doing a 180. And um, leaders need to be super thoughtful about what that plan is and how you construct it. And don't fall in the trap of just saying, well, I'm this and I like to be with people and this is the way companies operate, et cetera, but be a bit more nuanced here um, because that nuance unleashes a different model that can allow more flexibility in work can allow more geographic distribution of work, can allow people that may not have been as geographically flexible to get jobs now that might've only been in the Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. But it all comes back to, you better have a thoughtful plan about how you're constructing work, who's doing what, how you connect, et cetera, et cetera. That's the first message that I, uh, that I took away. 
The second one is the enablers to have this kind of vision happen are, are mostly there. The ability to have connectivity, broadband connectivity, that's kind of a fundamental issue. The ability to have office real estate that's gonna allow people to work in different places, et cetera. The ability to have digital tools that allow people to do this stuff that if you said, are the enablers there? Mostly they're there. This is not stuff that's 10 years uh, uh, away. And then the third message that I got is a broader message about the society we live in. And if uh, the, the model here says, if you want to ensure this broad digital transformation that has been accelerated by COVID happens successfully, then you better create a society where this is gonna happen more likely. And getting into some messages about, do we have enough of a safety net that people can feel like they're taking these moves and not risking their whole livelihood on it? And raising the question, do we have enough of that model in the US? Notwithstanding our view that you know we're we're great at innovation and we have an exceptionalist model, et cetera, which most people in the rest of the world cringe over, um, that we've got to be a little bit more thoughtful about: Are we creating this society that is going to uh, um, uh, allow pr uh, prosperity? Last last message related to that is public servants and public policy is not catching up in a way they need to and business leaders better think about the transition, the impact on workers, and how you kind of create this, this glide path. This is not something business leaders can punt to government to, to, uh, to deal with. Um, did I get your messages right? Anything you would add or, or change? So Terry, you're very close, 99%. And I would fully agree, you need a plan, right? The enablers exist. Um, there is, the societies need to step into this question and they're not. And so if businesses are stepping into that breach and is that enough and we need to do more. Um, I think that along with the enablers, I would say that though many of the pieces and parts exist, they're not being employed correctly. They haven't been architected in the way that is actually conducive to what we're describing. And often people are only thinking about what they see now, not what's coming. So remember these technologies are on an exponential curve they're doubling in performance power and having in cost every 18 months. So they are, this is going to get better and better and more and more interesting. Mm -hmm. So sorting a little bit back to the plan, it's not just how are we gonna navigate what's happening, it's how are we gonna navigate what's coming, this, this art of the possible opportunity that, mm -hmm. could, that, that, that is emerging. And those that are seeing that and taking advantage of it will accelerate very quickly into the forefront. So. Makes a huge amount of sense and a, a call to, uh, to action for all of us. Steve, let me just say a big, big thank you. As, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's very clear this is your profession. You've thought about this. You've thought about different models and your creative style saying, hey, listen, think laterally about these things. Don't just think about what we've been doing and how quickly we can kind of force it back. But there are a variety of ways to get these successes that can create uh, bigger gains. A huge, huge thank you. And I hope uh, you can make the time to come back and speak with us uh, again very soon. Big thank you. You're very welcome. Very much enjoyed this conversation and uh, good luck today. Thank you. Thank you.